So this session is very much an introduction and a flavour for what focus groups are, what they're not, <laughs> and perhaps um, when you might consider using them. So it's very much um, a sort of dipping your toe in the water for perhaps for people who are considering them. I will go into some more practical details of actually some of the challenges and, and how to work around actually running them. But for any people who haven't used focus groups before and are used to using them, I really recommend that you actually then go on and do some additional work to actually practice moderating, because actually if you're running them, um, it's quite a complex process and to get the base, most out of it. So we're not going to do any practical work in this session. I'm very much setting you up and hopefully whetting your appetite to do more about the same. Um, also, just to say, I will break at various intervals just to check understanding. Um, I can't see everybody in the room in terms of hands, but I can see the chat. So please do put in there and I'll say I will break. And I'm anticipating only talking for sort of 40 to 45 minutes so that we will have time for discussion at the end. So the aims of the session um, are really to try and unpack what we mean in terms of good practice, because <clears throat> what I'll talk about more throughout this is that focus groups are often used as a bit of a descriptor for a whole variety of different ways of conducting group um, interviews, focus groups, and there's, there's a lot of sort of um, confusion or, or perhaps sort of lack of accuracy of what we mean by it. So we're going to really explore what we mean, what is good practice in, in relation to that conduct of them. And we'll also look at the value of focus groups, why you would want to do them, what their particular merit is, um, and we'll particularly look at the role of focus groups versus interviews. And throughout the session, we're going to really try and unpack some of these practical, ethical and methodological issues. I'm going to draw on three particular studies that have used focus groups um, really as a way to try and illustrate how they can work really well, but again, some of the challenges um, in using them. So you'll all be familiar with focus groups outside healthcare. Um, they have got a long history, sort of based more in terms of therapeutic settings. And then obviously they've got a big history within market research. And we hear a lot about um, sort of from a government and political perspective of people running focus groups, mainly to sense check what is going on and to um, sort of get a flavour for perhaps how political policies are working in practice. Um, but from a working in applied health research, <clears throat> really the, in the hallmark of what a focus group um, research method is when we talk about it, is this study, as well as the content of what you hear, is actually thinking about the relationship between members, so who you're bringing into that group and the interaction between them. And I think if there's one message I want you to go away with is, is that that attentiveness to the interactive element is a key feature of focus group research. And actually, therefore, that means that it's not applicable to um, some research studies that you might be thinking about. It has been used increasingly in health research and really um, Kitzinger wrote quite a seminal paper in the BMJ about its use. And it has had more and more use, particularly often in mixed method studies um, and in terms of development work around survey development, but perhaps in terms of um, preparation for randomised controlled trials. And we'll explore a little bit more about that as we go through. So if we think the, that interactive process is quite key, um, one of the fundamental things we need to think about is what the purpose and the benefits of bringing a group together. And one of the distinctive features, if you think about an individual interview, is actually you're often interviewing somebody in a setting that may be outside their normal setting. So you're in a way severing any um, link to normal context and social behaviour. And so when we hear, when we ask questions to interview um, participants, we're often getting that sort of 
social desirability bias, but we're also getting that sense of them being quite detached from their everyday norms and behaviours. Um, so even if, um, I mean, that's where the advantage of something like ethnography is, where you see somebody in practice and that you're aware of those um, normal patterns. But focus groups are a sort of almost a, an additional way of perhaps trying to understand just those norms as they play out. Um, and so this idea is that we move away from creating completely artificial isolation from the context within which we want to study and actually try and mimic some of that by bringing group together. And so the whole idea behind a focus group is that somehow you can artificially in a way mimic those group discussions by bringing people together and actually seeing how the group plays out when they are considering certain things. Obviously, there are going to be factors that shape the success of that. And again, let's say we'll go through that as we um, move through the presentation. So a, a very common question is, you know, the benefits of, of running a focus group versus an interview. Um, so fundamentally, if we think about why, why would you choose to do one or the other? And these are the, the key ones, really. There are a lot more that I say we'll, we'll come to as we go through. But breadth and depth is one of the biggest distinctions between the two. So you would choose to do an individual interview if you wanted to um, get much more detail, perhaps, about individual experiences. And the beauty of about running an individual interview is that you have the opportunity to clarify meanings, to stop a participant as they go and to really probe and push and find out more about things that you're particularly interested in. In contrast, a focus group, you're not going to be able to get that detail to follow up individual narratives. So if you're interested in that individual variation and in particular experiences, you're not going to be able to do that through a focus group because to some extent you're limited by how participative the group are. But what you can get is this breadth. So you can get much more data about perhaps how culturally acceptable certain things are, um, variation between different members. Um, so you actually unpack sort of a much broader, in a way, say representation maybe of society or community groups in a way that you wouldn't through an individual interview. That the secondly, that obviously there's this focus at analytical level and the individual in an interview. Um, and actually in a focus group, it's much more that analytical level it is at group collective process. So again, if you're really interested in understanding that cultural process or social process, focus groups work really well. And part of that is perhaps to explore topics and see how the group responds to it, whether consensus is actually um, achieved and actually most people in the group share the same view, but also importantly, where there are silences, where there are disagreements and how decision making and reasoning play out in that group. So as I say, it's much more about the interaction that plays out around a topic. Interviews, again, can enable um, you to theorise and actually generate sort of models and frameworks from individual attitudes, um, whereas focus groups, in a way, you're doing much more comparative of how those attitudes that play out in practice. Um, and sort of lastly, and this is a really important point, is actually the bringing a group together can work very well, um, and we'll come back to that. But actually, it can also intimidate. So some people may not want to um, contribute in a group. Um, and that is often linked to the topic and the sensitivity around the topic and also who else is in the room. Um, but one of the benefits of a focus group is it can give time for people to think. They don't feel on the spot that they have to participate. And this idea of, of sort of giving people the chance to remain silent for part of it is quite an important aspect of it. How you bring people in, obviously, is a skill of moderation. So the purpose of focus groups really is to explore an issue 
Um, again, like all qualitative research, ideally it would be about something that there's little known about. You want to generate new knowledge. But importantly, we want to get a group of participants. And this is important of particular types. And we'll talk about sampling um, later. But the important thing is they have this collective knowledge. They have this sense that um, they're going to be able to contribute and you're going to be able to benefit from their experiences. And so the main purpose of it is that actually through bringing a group together, we can actually help people explore and clarify their views in ways that you wouldn't be able to do in a one to one interview because you'll get lots of different responses, perhaps to the same questions. But what you won't be able to do is build on those questions by listening to others and then taking up something in a different direction or building on it, um, which can work when focus groups work really well. That's when one question then triggers a whole debate and discussion and you move on to in a much more um, sort of perhaps often in a direction that you weren't anticipating, which you won't do just through an individual interview. Um, and I think this idea of unexpected directions is something really to be aware of that um, that in a sense could be a, a good part of running a focus group, but obviously it, it, it takes managing um, in terms of still being able to achieve what you had un intended. So I'm using Kitzinger and Bar Rose Barber has written a lot on focus groups. Um, and I think although people talk about focus groups, the way that um, I would tend to define them is that any group discussion can be called a focus group. But the key point is as long as the researcher is actively encouraging of and attentive to group interaction. And this is the, the key point is that attentiveness to the group is what, um, as I say, defines group interview from perhaps what we'd also call from a focus group from what we'd call a group interview. And just to clarify that, I'll just explain here. I think you can see the picture. You may well have been in focus groups before that are called so, but where maybe just the person moderating or facilitating directs questions and almost it's like a group interview because everyone just takes turns and there isn't any building on um, what participants are saying. So the difference is it's very much led and directed all eye contact is back through the um, facilitator. Whereas a successful focus group, as you can see on the right, what will happen is the facilitator moderator will give a question and then sit back and let the group run with it. They may have to bring it back in, but the whole idea is you're trying to see how that bounces off each other. And as I say, how you may get disagreement and you know being attentive to those disagreements. Um, or people just, you know, uh, achieving consensus because everyone's in agreement with perhaps the first response. So the benefits for those of you who perhaps are thinking about um, running focus groups um, is that it's a very powerful way of exploring contrary opinions. And therefore, if you're thinking about attitudes and behaviours, it can be a really nice way of understanding social norms and perhaps things that influence practices in a way that you'll, you'll get richer information than doing individual interviews. It can take you into new areas of understanding because again, um, the, the powerful nature of people working together can really give permission to almost take it in directions that you wouldn't get in an individual interview. It's powerful to hear people question each other because, again, you get a sense of what is socially desirable and acceptable in a way that you wouldn't through an individual interview. And this idea of, of listening to challenges and elaborations can really pick up again on um, understandings um, and some of the sort of tricky things that perhaps lie under the surface that people don't talk about. And also just through the group running with um, responses can actually help you refine arguments and it can provide this space. And this, the idea behind this is again that this is your, you're bringing a group together in situ and it's that powerful sense of the group feeling comfortable enough to run with it. 
And I think in terms of um, when, so f for in my um, previous work, we, 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 I've used focus groups successfully around the idea of patient safety, which again is sort of a social construct. Feeling safe means very different things to different people. And we were exploring it, um, particularly around perinatal complications and thinking about what does safe mean in that antenatal period, and it worked really well. So I think where you've got something that is, as I say, as a, a social construct and we're really trying to unpack it, it can work um, extremely well. And in terms of actually seeing perhaps what are the dominant views and perhaps less um, um, peripheral views, it can be really important. And it can also unpack where people are uncomfortable, where silence, where people actually feel less able to contribute. Um, but I think one of the things to be really aware of is, can we really mimic everyday normal activity and events and practices? And that is very much dependent on the topic that you're introducing and also perhaps the group that you're bringing as to how likely that is or whether actually you're going to end up with just still quite a front stage scene and that people are still uncomfortable and not really contributing in a, a meaningful way. So I think that is something to be aware of, is just bringing a group together is not necessarily going to engender um, trust and relationships to enable you to, to get the most benefit out of it. So we'll just cover a, a couple of uses for focus groups and then we're going to actually just um, focus, um, introduce three different um, studies just to bring things a bit more to life. So. Common uses um, is often in the development of other tools. So it could be that you're developing a survey or questionnaire and actually want to do some exploratory work into perhaps the translation of the material. So if you're, um, if I, it's been used quite a lot in terms of survey development from different contexts, from different countries, trying to unpack some of the language and acceptability around things as to whether they have the same meaning and also even before that for developing what people see as important um, so that development work can, um, it can it has a, a role interestingly although we said before with interviews that actually there's trade-offs between interviews and focus groups in terms of the topic if you are talking about very sensitive topics people often feel uncomfortable in an individual interview and it can be easier to talk about sensitive topics in a group, but also a group can be prohibited by if, if the topic is, is really quite personal. So that's something that often needs a little bit of exploratory work as to whether the topic actually lends itself to a group setting. Again, my experience of, of looking at perinatal safety is that we found that people, we worked a lot with minority groups and we found that um, we would struggle to get um, people to participate to individual interviews, whereas because we recruited through community groups and they were naturally occurring groups that already felt quite safe with each other, that worked really well. And then we were able to actually talk about really some quite sensitive aspects of that. Um, and I think this feeds into the assessing the reluctance. So there are um, participants who may feel quite intimidated by the whole idea of an interview um, and might feel safer coming into a group. Um, so I can see your point, Matt. We will, yeah, I'm going to come on to ethics later. So yeah, hold on to that. But there are different ethical considerations. And I think one of this, this question of why not, so why, um, what participants think about services and perhaps if you've set up a pilot service and haven't got the um, expected responses, that can work really well to sort of test some of the attitudes and norms around why things haven't worked. Um, and this idea of development of an intervention. So when not to use focus groups, I think as we've sort of acknowledged that if you really want to explore individual narratives and what makes them individual in a way, bringing a group together will confound and disturb that. Um, this second point is a really important point. Focus groups are often costed into bids as a sort of 
cheap way to do several interviews at the same time and actually they don't serve the same purpose and the danger is that you'll end up with very thin data um, so I don't suggest that at all although you know people can see that it's it's cost saving um, there are issues they're extremely difficult to organize um, from a practical perspective and it, importantly this idea of representativity because actually if you bring together six people into a focus group you can't um, anticipate that they will all participate so even though you will say that you've got these people and you can give their um, demographic background it really doesn't assure the fact that you're going to hear from them in the group so I think again there's different issues about if you really are wanting to have a sampling frame and bring people to that you hear from you're going to get much more um, sort of robust data through an interview whereas a focus group you've got much more uncertainty around that um, as we've said, there are some topics that maybe a group wouldn't feel comfortable um, to share their own individual opinions. And this idea of technical and organisational challenges is not to be underestimated in terms of how to recruit the right number, but you tend to always over recruit because people drop out. But then I've had experiences of we, where we've had a massive drop out and then we've been left with two people. Do you carry on or do you just... Um, you know, wait and restructure. So I think it, it's it's difficult. Um, so I'm just now going to move on um, to talk about three particular papers, which hopefully will illustrate how focus groups can work quite differently. So this was a psychology um, focused project that was really looking at health as a moral phenomena, and they were really interested in the whole idea around guilt and responsibility around behaviours, um, such as eat, eating, drinking, smoking and drug use. But they also were interested in that flip side of almost this idea of transgressive behaviour when people actually reject expert opinion. And they really wanted to understand sort of what sort of behaviours, how people made sense of and how decided how to behave. So you can see as a study, focus groups work really well with this because this whole idea of, of morality and um, how people should work. Um, and they were interested as well as, as sort of how that was located within public tr trust in medicine, science, and also this idea about government interventions. So, you know, nice rationale for way, why focus groups worked for this particular study. The next study um, was actually looking at cervical screening results. They were interested in exploring variability in terms of how um, women received results of cervical screening. And again, on the face of it, a nice um, rationale for using it just in terms of exploring um, women's individual experiences of receiving results and what that meant and how useful it was at that particular time and through that particular mode of delivery. And the last study, um, again, it's an interesting one. It's, it was this was published in 2022, um, and this was actually trying to explore how contextual factors influence antibiotic um, prescribing decisions. Now, particularly focusing on intensivists, where there's a bit of a research gap around this, um, and this was preparatory work that they were devising a randomised controlled trial to look at um, treatment of pneumonias um, and they wanted to um, run some focus groups and interviews to explore how those factors shaped individual prescribing attitudes um, and the focus groups were preparatory work to then interviews where they used vignettes to actually um, explore in more detail that um, decision making processes. So again, three very different research um, topics, but you can see the rationale for each of those as to why they used um, focus groups. And we'll come back to a little bit more about each of those studies. So a typical focus group, you're probably going to want to use a, between six to eight. Um, the literature suggests anything up to 12, but again, large groups can be difficult to moderate. But because we often have to over recruit in a way you need to be prepared for everybody to turn up. 
Um, it's very helpful to have an assistant moderator as well as a moderator, and that will become clear later. But the moderator will encourage the conversations, will start the ball rolling, but will also be very attentive to that group interaction. Um, the assistant moderator is there really to actually support the moderator. They may come in as necessary, but really importantly, they will take notes about non-verbal behaviour, which is very difficult for the moderator to be attentive to, and to also document the sequence of talk. Characteristically, you'll transcribe, you'll um, record and transcribe it. But transcribing is incredibly difficult because hearing voices while you're in the room is one thing, but when you come to the transcript, it can be quite difficult to identify who has said what, particularly if people are speaking over. <clears throat> So you would, with group consent, you would record it and as I say, you would try and collect that additional non-verbal um, behaviour. There are different forms of data analysis, which we don't have time to go into today, but you can do much more thematic, which is much more focused on the content. And then you can do um, discourse analysis, which is actually thinking about how talk sort of acts. And you can also do ethnographic um, forms of analysis where you're much more attentive to the purpose of the group. Um, so there are different ways. I think in terms of how the focus group is run, um, again, nice variation in different sort of ways that you can try and make people feel at ease using icebreakers. But also there's some really successful ways of using stimuli and materials to try and get people um, to start talking. So again, you can use vignettes to make it less personal, um, and then people can build on the vignettes with their own experiences. Um, you can use ranking exercises or scales, again, as a point of entry to then generate discussion. You can use photos. Um, it's a really nice way of using, of, of sort of sounding out new technologies to actually bring the technology and to try it out in the group. Um, I've used it with film um, really successfully. We um, created a film that we then wanted to test in other groups um, and actually played the film and then sort of got sense making around the content of the film, the imagery, the language. Um, and also you can use other forms of games, activities, role play. But it really brings, takes you in a different direction because you've got the group rather than um, perhaps what you're limited to with an individual interview. Obviously in COVID, we all had to flip to online focus groups, um, which did work. I think they're harder to moderate than um, physically in-person groups. And if you're running a synchronous internet-based focus group, you do really need small groups to be able to manage and be attentive to the people in the room. Um, you can actually also use data from sort of real-time chat rooms, messaging, almost as a, a way of accessing that natural process. And you know, some research actually makes use of asynchronous, where there's a time lag, to actually look at sort of trails or, or um, bulletin boards web forums, how things have developed. But again, I mean, I think there's, there's issues around actually where that takes you. It's, it's limited in terms of you being able to introduce and um, actually steer the group in a particular direction. I'll come back to that question about the focus groups with the community groups because I think that will play into the ethics later. So thank you for that question. Um, so sampling and constructing a focus group. Um, this is one of the crucial things about how do you bring a group together? Um, do you stratify? Do you want a range of views or do you want similarity in the room? I think one of the most important things is to choose a topic that has relevance to people so that you don't get people arriving in, sitting in the room who then don't feel they've got anything to contribute. So you have to have people who feel they have, you know, almost authenticity or legitimacy to actually um, contribute. 
And I think there's a lot to suggest that you can recruit through pre-existing groups. So as say, I recruited through piggybacked onto antenatal groups that were already set up through the NHS. And then I also used some postnatal breastfeeding groups. Um, the issue about that is to be very mindful of who's in the group. And I think this speaks to the, the fact of how that community group is established, perhaps who you're not going to hear from and even the power and hierarchy that exists within that group. Um, if you bring together participants who don't know each other, then you, you need to be very mindful of other factors that will play into how people feel maybe intimidated. Um, so this idea of heterogeneity and homogeneity is a really important one and very attentive to power. Um, and this idea that actually, as soon as you introduce any form of hierarchy, you are likely to silence or at least affect um, the group. And this can be really quite difficult to manage. Um, and this idea of, of potentially having to over recruit to make sure that um, you get enough people in the room. So I'm going to come back to these papers just for you to actually see how they managed it. So interestingly, for this first paper on health as a moral phenomenon, they very much worked on the basis of actually bringing together groups that were already well formed. So they, um, their sampling frame included a group of seven unemployed men and four women belonging to the local job club. They also brought together a group from the Women's Institute and then a self-forming group of seven female friends. They recognised, they were attentive to in terms of their sampling frame, thinking about things like education, age, gender. Um, so they also were attentive to the fact that they didn't have any younger participants. So they recruited via the university um, for a, a fourth focus group. So you can see they very much wanted groups that already had a sense of familiarity and trust with one another. The cervical screening study, interestingly, they organised seven focus groups and they had three to eight women um, for each. They were organised based on the basis of similar screening results. They wanted to bring people together because they felt, felt that sort of familiarity around the results would enable people to feel comfortable. What actually happened in practice was that women's previous screening experiences actually seemed was actually more important than the screening result. So they ended up with much more mixed groups in terms of participation than they had originally intended. Now, for this study was interesting. They were obviously bringing people in new and they only um, only 18 percent, one eight of women approached consented to participate and only nine percent actually attended the discussion. And they were <clears throat> very aware of the fact that they were mostly well-educated, married, non-smoking, white British women. So in terms of recruiting through that sort of novel approach just by the screening results, um, they were quite limited. And the third study, which if you remember was about antibiotic prescribing in intensive care, they, um, they I think had four focus groups and they range from 11 to five people in each of the groups. Um, they wanted to, within the focus groups, they needed to have people who actually had experience of prescribing. But I think this is one example of one of the groups which had four ICU consultants, two middle grade trainees, one early career trainee, and then a microbiologist, a pharmacist and a health psychologist. And I think what is interesting to be attentive to is perhaps how some of those, the early career trainee, perhaps, I don't know, it, it's, it's being very attentive to if you've got five consultants, um, you know, whether that's actually going to likely to shape um, acceptability of perhaps saying things that might not be socially um, acceptable. And interestingly, in this, the results, they did very much say that um, there was consensus, there was very little discrepancy. And you wonder whether that was almost a, a sense of um, that hierarchy playing a, a role. So <clears throat> the last um, bit I want to talk about really is the practicalities of 
of, of running a focus group. So getting off to a good start is very much about actually seeing who's in the room, um, alerting you beforehand to perhaps who's going to talk a lot and how you're going to manage that. Um, thinking about the seating arrangements, consent is really important and we'll come back to it. Um, the ground rules about not talking over each other, introductions, um, and also how people want to, um, whether it's use of name badges, but think about whether you're going to start off by the one introducing themselves. But again, if you do that, that can, that can sort of take 20 minutes before you've even started. But again, it's going to be really important if people don't know each other to think about how you set the scene. I think what is really important is when you start to almost give permission to disagree and to set those rules of engagement. So this idea of being free to, to explore ideas, there's no right or wrongs. And importantly, you don't have to speak through the moderator. Um, <clears throat> but this idea of not interrupting others is really important. And coming back to this issue about ethics, one of the important things is that actually people may disclose something in a focus group and actually although you can get verbal consent and written consent in a way you're opening yourself up to people then sharing that information outside the group so it's really important before you start to highlight that that actually that people are cognizant of um, this is a group um, Sort of process and that they have to be very mindful of not disclosing names and confidential information in that. Um, so I think that's a really important ethical point um, to really flag up and, and sort of be attentive to at the beginning. To be a moderator takes a lot of skill. Every focus group will be different and will need a lot of thinking on, on your feet. And this idea of not controlling, of letting a group run is really quite challenging. Um, and I think it's this idea of being confident enough to let people run with something, but also to make sure that you're, you keep it on topic. Um, and that often is just about interjecting and bringing um, sort of it back to focus, but perhaps then allowing them to come back to something that they obviously feel strongly about later on. Um, but as with an interview, the interview interviewer shapes the research data, and that's absolutely the case that the moderator is going to have a major influence on the research data generated in terms of how controlling the moderator is. And that's really important. So one thing that's really important to think about is how the assistant moderator can help. So if you think this is a sketch where the assistant moderator has just initialised all the people sitting in the room um, and has sort of made note of their first names. Now, the reason this is important is because when you get your type transcript back, um, it's really important to make a note of who said what so that you can actually then track back in that transcript. So for the assistant moderator, it's really helpful. You can't obviously verbatim um, record what's going on. But what you can do is, is actually record who says and record the first couple of words. And that means then you can track in that transcript who said what. Because as I say, it might sound easy and that people's voices will enable recognition. It's actually very difficult in practice, particularly when people are excited and talking over one another. So this is a really good way of actually um, helping out with that transcript um, later on. Practical issues, again, thinking about the space that you're in, the recording equipment, whether you bring refreshments. It always works really well to have refreshments to make sure the space is, is conducive. Um, and again, use of name labels um, and whether you're going to pick up with the group afterwards, whether you're going to have any follow up. Um, and I think debriefing for both moderator and assistant moderator is always important. So yes, one of the questions was um, about, well, both questions actually were about ethical considerations. So one of the big issues is around creating a safe space where people will feel able to talk. And again, in my experience of communities, 
we had to be very careful to recruit a community space where certainly in, in our case women felt able to talk safely um, so think about the environment does it send signals if it's in a hospital or a, a university site um, you may well not get the same level of participation than if you choose you chose another um, venue um, Disclosure and use of names, again, I've, I've talked about that briefly, but that's really important. And this idea of Chatham House rules of what stays in that group, you know, being respectful of it. And that perhaps people can talk about the content, but not who said it. Um, it is, it's a difficult one to manage. And again, it comes back to actually thinking about the sensitivity of the topic. So one of the other um, questions in the chat is about if you recruit from an established community group, are there any concerns to be utilised the community leader in moderating the group? Again, there are different ways of doing it. So I've um, one of the groups I ran, we had we used a community leader um, really because of translational issues. Um, and so they translated and actually worked with me um, to actually run the group. And that was really powerful. I wouldn't have, A, through language, but also through that rapport and trust. Um, again, it's been very mindful of perhaps some of the issues that community groups may have um, that, you know, almost just being respectful of, of why they're there and why it's important to them and making sure the topic has significance for them as well. So, Last couple of slides, I'd say in terms of analysis, um, what we really try and look at is what's shared, what's taken for granted, what needed further clarification, um, when things were challenged, and also that idea of, of sort of tone of voice when people get excited about things when not. Use of humour can be really interesting, but also this real idea of silence. When is the awkwardness? Um, which can really give you insight. And I'm just going to finish by sort of just reflecting on those three papers. So health as a moral phenomena is a really nice example of where they have used the whole of the fo a focus group excerpt um, as an example of how the group moderated um, the conversation. So here they're talking about um, leaflets being sponsored by the government do you think the government have a right to change people's behavior and the moderator asks and so the conversation starts i think they have the right to tell us what's potentially dangerous another one says if they didn't we'd say but then r says but i think it's our right to decide we'll stop or we will go on 7k again agrees i don't think they can dictate to us and then r says again but they're making life difficult for people like me you can go around with a thing around your neck. There's lots of places I can't go anymore. This person is talking about smoking. But interestingly, at that point, E comes in and says, yes, because it gives me my asthma. I don't want your smoke in my face. Thank you very much. And that's the point where the conversation then changed. And all that E was then actually challenging and pushing back on R. And the conversation then switched very rapidly. So again, it was a really nice example of a group conversation being reported in a paper. And I contrast that with the cervical screening result paper where what was reported was just individual um, responses. And I think when you see sort of individual responses reported, in a way there's a sense of how is this different to an interview? So if they had interviewed all of these people rather than having them in a group, would there have been any difference? Um, and I think it's an interesting one, um, yeah, in terms of the purpose of focus groups. So I'm going to finish there. So we've got 15 minutes for questions, but hopefully I've given you a nice insight into focus groups. They can provide a really nice blend of perspectives and opinions, but importantly, you can really get this idea of consensus and social norms within the group. It does take a lot of effort and expenditure of, our, of time to plan and all the organisational preparation. Over recruitment is of, often a, an effective strategy, but you may end up having a lot of people then in the room. It does need skills to moderate. And I think 
just leaving you with this um, sense of really being attentive to these status differences between participants, also between you as a moderator and them, the size of the focus group, and also the specificity of what it is you're talking about. How meaningful is it um, for that discussion? So I think I'm going to um, finish sharing. Oh, wonderful, brilliant. So I can see hands now. So I think, do you pay people in a focus group or do you give? Yeah. So that's quite variable. Um, I paid people for, we provided refreshments in the community groups um, and we also gave vouchers. I think one of the things to be mindful of is, is that you, that may enable people to feel that they're coming for the voucher rather than them feeling they've got something to contribute. But I always still feel it's actually really in recognition of the fact they're giving up time. What I should have said is focus groups characteristically can run for two hours. It's not, it's a sizable chunk of time. So therefore I feel it is really important to actually recompense um, for people's contribution. But they may well not contribute. And in a sense, that's OK. You just need to think about if you've only got one or two people contributing, what that says, really. Um, have I used the photo elicitation method during focus groups? I haven't myself. Um, I think it potentially could work really well, because I think, in a sense, in, in the same way that we used video, we were really interested in some of the imagery and how that triggers conversations. So you could use photo elicitation either generating your own bank of photographs or with people bringing their own photos in and then generating discussion around them. Um, so I think that would work very well. What does the location of the focus group have to play in determining the ability? So I think this is about sensibility. So um, for instance, some of my work is around perinatal trauma. And again, we would not run a focus group in a hospital setting for that very reason. We'd have to be very mindful of choosing a venue that people felt safe. And often we would um, bring in sort of counselling services as a support mechanism just in case it then led to um, one or other people needing additional support. So we then had to think about safe venue, but also um, where could we have people in another room so that if people needed to leave a focus group. Because if people are really participating in a focus group, they will um, contribute emotionally as well. So I think it's it's thinking about that dynamic. Um, um, how do you use diagrams photos effectively without narrowing the discussion? Nice question, Tanya. I mean, to be honest, any form of um, video or um, sort of vignette is in a way restricting the focus down around what it is you, you use as a trigger. So you have to balance the fact that if you just go in cold with just, you know, a couple of icebreakers and then you open it up, um, is that a better way to do it? So you're not predefining what people then talk about, or does it feel so open and a bit overwhelming that it's better to start off with a vignette or um, a photo? and then hope that it flows out and you encourage people to move beyond that photo. But I think with all of these things, there isn't a right and wrong, and there's, it's always a, a business of trade-offs. And what we as researchers do at the end is to reflect on perhaps what worked well, but perhaps you know where it didn't for learning for future research, and hopefully that comes through in papers that reflect on it. Um, I think I've worked through all the questions. Um, anything else anyone would like to ask about?
And so I think they're a very powerful um, method, but um, I think one of the, the, the pragmatic challenges, the ethical challenges, yeah, shouldn't be really sort of taken lightly. Um, and interestingly, I think when, if, if you run a series of focus groups, it's characteristic that you'll, you'll get very, very different dynamics within those focus groups um, and very different material. Um, so that's interesting in itself. Um, I think I missed a question. If it goes quiet for a long time, how long do you wait? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a tough question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think often it's about how comfortable you feel as a moderator. Um, I think a bit of social discomfort's okay, because I think what's often interesting, and we run as in our EMRO, we also um, the students then actually practice facilitating a focus group themselves. And it is interesting because often when you run sort of trial focus groups, what happens is one of the participants will jump in. So it's often really good if you can for you not to jump in and see how long the group can sit with it. Um, again, it's that thing often about our sense of needing to control something. But again, there isn't a, a right and wrong um, for that. Um, how do you deal with the hierarchy issue? Um, I think the simple truth about the hierarchy issue is to really think about, is it worth you trying to bring peers together who are much more well matched? Um, and that could be about being attentive to issues around gender, age, education. I mean, at a workplace, it's thinking about professional roles, seniority. Um, you can't you can't do away with it, but you can really think about it sensitively. Um, do you follow up with a private interview for people who, who feel couldn't contribute? I think this is an interesting one, is actually if you've got somebody who is very quiet and doesn't contribute. It's difficult because you can try and bring them in, but actually being almost singling them out can feel quite uncomfortable too. So I've learned very much to try and be inclusive and sort of make a general statement about, you know, there are those of you who perhaps have been quieter, it'd be lovely to hear from you rather than putting people on the spot. And I think I would not follow up because I think part of the focus group process is you being respectful of um, of people's level of participation, what that might be. What is important then is to reflect on perhaps the numbers that were quiet and why that was. Um, but what you could do is actually one of the nice things um, is as a thank you, you could always open that up and say, if you didn't feel that you could contribute or whatever, please do get in touch and we can do a follow up interview and do that to everybody rather than singling somebody out. Um, good, glad, glad you saw that. <laughs> Brilliant, well, I hope that was helpful. Um, yeah, and as I say, for those of you interested, I really, really recommend you do some practice um, and, yeah, and sort of try it out just to practice being a moderator because it's, yeah. Um, fabulous. So shall I wrap up there, Tricia? Yes, thanks, Nicola. That's brilliant. Really interesting. Um, I've just sent a link to the um, our video channel on YouTube. So when we'll download yours and pop yours on there perhaps tomorrow, and that's and I'll send an evaluation format. So I'd be really help, be glad if somebody, if a few people could fill that in. It really helps us in the future to, to sort these sessions out. But that was really good. Thanks a lot, Nicola. Okay, fantastic. All right.